Why is it so damn hot? It is a desert after all. Duck Brown, how are you here? Well, I'm exerting some of my power just to reach you. Reach me? Where are you then? Trying to find a good route to get to your planet. Until then, you and the other wolves are probably on your own. Well, great. But at least I'm not really alone. How could you be alone when I'm right here? <sighs> You're kind of just annoying at this point, to be honest. Well then, I guess I'll have to start working on my master plan. <laughs> Anyways, I should probably continue these reviews just so I don't go crazy. I know this one has been asked a lot, but let's finally get this review out of the way. Gegege no Kitaro. Before I start this review, I should probably bring up that Gege no Kitaro has been remade or rebooted about five times ever since its original run in 1968. And with that time, they've had ten movies. One in 1968 simply called Gegege no Kitaro, one in 1980 called Gegege no Kitaro The Divining Eye, one in 1985 called Gegege no Kitaro The Yokai Army, three in 1986 called Gegege no Kitaro The Great Yokai Army, the strongest yokai army disembark for Japan and clash the great Re and clash the great rebellion of the dimensional yokai. One in 1996 called Gegege no Kitaro the Great Sea Beast. Two in 1997 called Gegege no Kitaro Obake Niter and Yokai Express the Phantom Train. And one in 2008 called Gegege no Kitaro Japan Explodes. Not only that, but according to Wikipedia, the start of Gegege no Kitaro was with Masami Ito in 1933 in the form of a street theater of Kamishibai with the actual name of it being Kitaro of the Graveyard or Hakaba Kitaro. It became a rental manga in 1960, but renamed in 1965 to Hakaba no Kitaro as it was, re as it was considered too scary for children. Then in 1967, it was renamed to Gege no Kitaro, and continued its run as that as that name to today. So, with all that backstory out of the way, I'm going to completely disregard everything that isn't what happens in this episode. It's definitely not the smartest thing to do, to just, you know, jump into a series that has rebooted so many times and knowing basically nothing about the character, but screw it. I've seen many, many comments about reviewing this specific episode. So that's all I'm going to review, and all I'm going to see. This is the 2018 version of Gege no Kitaro, episode 23. First of all, this has been recommended for me to review a lot, as I said earlier, but the main one who was pushing for this was Simba Cartoon Fan. The same one who was the main push for Hell Teacher Nube, which I enjoyed. So let's see if this episode is good like how Nube was. It opens up with a flashback of events, I think. Not knowing things about the series sure makes it difficult for me. From what I can gather, Kitaro is a yokai and wants to help humans. Something that probably isn't liked by other yokai. The episode actually opens up with some old guy in a bath, eyes closed, and trying to tell himself he didn't see whatever he saw, assuming it's a yokai or ghost or something. There are other characters being shown as well, but I wonder if they're all in the same house or not. One's a woman under a blanket hiding from a, I guess, motherly figure? One is the guy in the bathtub, and one is the guy coming back from work, I think. They're jumped by different yokai, two of which I recognize but not by name, those two being the Cyclops Umbrella and the Long-Necked Woman. The Yokai Apartment Secret Story. Fun. So it's an entire building being haunted rather than a person. We get a few shots of this empty apartment and seeing some new woman helping the movers take stuff away from the apartment. This woman has a key to the place, so she might be the owner of the apartment complex. But, we finally meet Kitaro as he knocks on the door and asks her to reconsider tearing it down. So, that was some nice exposition. Didn't seem all too forced, but enough of that. We have to see old video footage of the apartment. Apparently, this was Kitaro telling the story of the apartment being built to the current owner, who was the granddaughter of the two owners back in 1968. She should know this stuff already. Of course, she doesn't believe that there are yokai in the apartment, because who would? 
She somehow lets him continue the story as we see the three tenants from the beginning complaining about the ghost to the grandparents. The grandfather asks the yokai to go away, and we get introduced to who they are as if this was a Smash Brothers trailer. <laughs> So, we have Roku Okubi, Akaname, and Karakasa, three harmless but scary looking yokai. The yokai state that the place was built on a graveyard, because that's almost always how ghosts haunt buildings, but also because the building was facing the wrong way, or something like that. Angered by this, the couple tries to bless the place and dispel the evil spirits, but it fails. Also, apparently the yokai can make themselves invisible to people whenever they want to. So, they overhear about Kitaro being a yokai exterminator, quote-unquote. So, they send a letter to him, which confuses the current owner because Kitaro looks like a young boy, but is also old enough to be able to have been in the contact with her grandparents and still look the same as if he had never aged. The owner then kind of passes out from seeing an actual yokai that was in Kitaro's hair. Now we get back to what the flashback slash sepia footage from earlier was about, which becomes a fight scene that gets cut short despite Toei being the ones behind this anime. At least according to the opening crawl. Kataro wins off screen and the yokai cry about leaving because it's the best home they've been in, but then we cut away to 1971 for some reason, I don't know. The couple are doing well, even with the yokai still in the apartment, because their arrangement was to keep their presence hidden from humans, and they could stay in the building. Then we cut to 1985 for another time skip, as we see a land shark crash into their building, just to try to extort them for money. Now, before I continue this, there's a little bit about Japanese history that should probably be explained to help give reason for the land shark's appearance. Land and loan sharks are always horrible people, doing awful things to people for payments of debt, Asian one especially. However, around 1986, there was an economic bubble beginning to form. This was happening after a previous recession, the Endaka Recession, which came out of a strong appreciation of the Japanese yen. With the yen at such a high value, exports would naturally decrease because it's just too expensive compared to other currencies, leading to a recession. While all this was going on, as well as aggressive economic policy was in place to try to weaken the yen, property prices increased in value, and land sharks would use force or other ways to gain these properties. Now, I couldn't find much information about actual land sharks in Japan during this time, because most information of the bubble looks through economic models and terms rather than a deep dive into criminal means. For at least some information, look up Masuko X's video about Frieza being a land shark. He goes a little into it after about the halfway point. Jumping back into Gegege no Kitaro, the grandparents think about leaving the apartment and giving in to the land shark, but Kitaro and his group of yokai decide, nah, fuck that, let's just scare the bejesus out of them. This defense of the property by the main trio yokai of the story puts them in an even better light to the grandparents. However, getting back into the present time, we meet the fiancé of the current owner, who has a similar jacket to one of the Yakuza of the past, as we see him push aside his fiancé and getting the, just to get the deed and registered seal to the place. He smacks the clock for... reasons, and as he leaves, the yokai trio come back and attack him, but he's able to get out of there even in fear. After being lied to by her supposed fiancé, getting attacked over the deed and seal, the owner's... Br the owner is broken mentally and thinks what's happened to her is some sort of punishment. The clock ticks and we see a flashback to her life, where she was raised by her grandfather after losing her mother and grandmother, and the yokai of the apartment played with her as a child, but stopped interacting with her in fear that she might not be able to live a normal human life if they continued to interact with her. Sadly, the yokai had to live with this knowledge and inability to interact with her, but continued to watch over her as she grew up to where she is now. 
as the episode ends with her crying in the arms of the yokai, and the land sharks being attacked again by Kitaro and his yokai over the seal indeed, as well as other yokai moving in and living in the apartment. So, how was it? Well, I definitely know a bit more about loan sharks and why they're always portrayed as one of the worst kinds of humans, at least. Most of the actual story takes place in the past, which jumps around a little bit, with the present time being pretty uneventful up until the end. It's a story about the grandparents of the current owner owning a place haunted by yokai, experiencing financial difficulties, then being okay, then getting intimidated by landlords or land sharks, and then the granddaughter thinking about selling the property, and getting attacked by a member of the land shark, realizing her past with the yokai, and later just opening up the apartment for yokai to live in. Looking deeper into it, it's an alright story. The yokai involved aren't dangerous at all, but still cause trouble for the couple until Kitara helps sort things out. Because they loved living in the apartment, are willing to comply with an agreement to keep their living space, and going after the land sharks twice. Kitaro's character is also an interesting one. A yokai that helps get rid of other yokai for humans through fighting and or diplomacy. If I had to rate this episode, I'd say it's a 6 out of 10. The story isn't much of a spectacle. It's average. Nothing too big stood out aside from the humanizing of yokai. Would I recommend the episode? I don't think I would. It's not because I think it's bad or anything, but it's just too average, I believe. And I don't think people would be that interested in the yokai story if they aren't already aware of what yokai are. I'm Wolf, and I'll see you all later. Much desert. Listen, Wolf, I'm not sure how much help I can be. My connection is weakening with you, so it may be a while before we see each other yet again. What? Don't go. Please, Duck Brown. You're still strong even without me. I believe you will survive these harsh conditions. You should have enough supplies already, plus maybe find cactus fruits around here. But whatever you do, don't give in to your emotions. <laughs>